Okay, let's get started. Welcome back to System Software. And um, I guess before we get started, any questions on the final project, on compiler optimizations? Yeah. So for our last project for Arrays, like, why do you want us to do it? Well, that's just a bonus project, so you don't have to do it. Yeah, but like, so if you did it, how are you going to test it? I'll just test it manually. Make up, make some test cases to demonstrate that it's working and just show me during office hours and I'll, and I'll grade it. So yeah, we're not going to automatically grade it. And is it going to be worth the full points at the project, or no? It's worth up to the bonus bonus points. So yeah, yeah. This is yeah. This is bonus projects are here. The twelve points already, you know. Yeah. That's already uh, built in to the regular projects. That's really if you're you know very interested in this, you can do this. So it's not for the points. It's for out of interest. Yeah. So when a, a function has been written, are you supposed to be able to write functions within a function? Uh, that's a really good question. Do we have, or do we allow? So in simple C, no. We don't have these nested functions. Um, last semester, I did a language where we did have nested functions. Uh, and a lot of modern languages mm -hmm. allow nested functions. And there's some complexity about how you um, deal with the scoping of these of the variables in these functions, because not only do you have multiple uh, nested scopes, you have to keep track of um, the uh, stack as well. Because depending on whether you call a function that's a parent or you know some ancestor that's far away, uh, you you have to be able to find that the local variables for all the functions at any time. And so, if you look in the Dragon Book, there's, there's some, just like we have the dynamic link, the you know the um, the pointer to the previous stack frame. Um, we also have the static link, which helps you find this, the link. Oh, what the hell am I saying? Helps you find the stack frame of the parent functions as well. So if you look in the Dragon Book, just look up, you know, static link. Uh, it's in there as well. And if you want to do like a bonus project on it, you can come talk to me and I'll, yeah. Yeah. Another question. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if I understand this, but when you uh, initialize your function with mm -hmm. you have your define uh, your type and then your at name and mm -hmm. the, the variables in the parentheses are they supposed to be allocated immediately following that is that how that works or yeah they're, they're you can treat them just like local variables so I think I gave an example where yeah I mean LLVM does this as well, well where they're that's what I was saying but I wasn't yeah. sure the only special thing is that the money sign, the, the first couple of registers will be the parameter values. So like percent sign zero, percent sign one. Uh, and so what LLVM does, well, like, well, Clang, what Clang does to generate the LLVM code and what LLVM gives you is you immediately allocate local space for it and then move, store the, the uh, register values of the parameters into, into memory. Okay, yeah, go ahead. And then you have the parentheses. Uh -huh. I noticed in the uh, the, uh, the um, old script I had uh, a, a dollar sign zero or a zero dollar sign or something like that. And I, I wasn't sure if that was supposed to be implemented in all the functions or if that was. Just was that part of main? Yeah. That made it just. That might have just been uh, attributes. It's LVM it's attributes. Main Uh, I think it's just, I think it's just, oh, that, the, this, the, the pound sign. Uh, these are just LLVM uh, attributes. It's, you don't have to worry about it. it you can, it's, it's used for some compiler specific stuff. Uh, I don't, if, as long as it compiles, it should be fine. So you can, you can see that in like the language ref about this. There are these attribute groups. You can, yeah, specify these kind of. Uh, hints to how you want the how you how you want these functions to be compiled, but don't worry about those. That's like very technical details about about LLVM. Uh, oh, by the way, so I released all the secret test cases because there were some issues with the, with the secret test cases. So everybody has all of them now, uh, and as we have the project four ones, you'll have those as well. Uh, so sorry for making you struggle on those. I was hoping that people would kind of write their own test cases and everything, but it's okay. It's not it's not a huge deal. Uh, 
Okay, other questions like optimization project four? What questions do you have? Okay, so we're getting close to the end of the semester and end of the material. Uh, today I'm going to go over a fun topic. I think it's fun, software security. And then we'll look at program analysis, which is kind of an extension of compiler optimizations. And that'll end the kind of new content. And then we'll just have two more courses of review, classes for review, and final exam. Yeah, it'll be easy. It's going to be your homework questions. And that's it. Maybe all of them, yeah. But they're all very short, right? They're all very short. I mean, the, the prompts are very short. So it'll be like some mix of basically tweaked versions of your homework. Yeah. And this is going to be like how many questions, 50 questions? I think I'll probably do like 20 questions, 10 multiple choice, 10 short answer, something like that. I'll give specifics as the day approaches. Do you have a computer or something like that? You can just use your notes. You can, you can have open notes. But no, like laptops or anything. No, no electronics. Yeah. Review sheets. I'll go over and review. So I'll give like yeah. We just the homework is your review. So whatever whatever like questions you have during these two review sessions, we can just bring what questions you have and we'll go over. Or I can sort of reteach or or uh, go into more detail about whatever topics sort of as needed. What what everyone needs. Yeah. Sense. Um, okay, other questions? What are questions? All right, so today is a, in my opinion, a very fun topic, just software security. I think security is a very exciting thing. Um, not everybody's into it, though. It does require a slightly criminal mind to do it, because you have to kind of think, um, well, this is kind of the, the crux of it is normally when you're writing software, you think, how do I make sure that this software does what it's supposed to do, right? That's like getting rid of bugs. But security is kind of the same thing, but it's, it's, it's like the, the, uh, the, um, the contrary of that. How do you make sure that software doesn't do what it's not supposed to do? So it almost seems like it's the same thing, but it's, but it's, uh, but it's not. So I'm gonna be borrowing some slides from this guy, Matthias Payer. Uh, and just go over some of the sort of basic principles of, of, of uh, software security and really any kind of security. Um, and then we'll look at memory attacks and then I'll show you a stack smashing attack, which is like a really classic uh, exploit for getting um, root privileges or you know, running arbitrary code uh, on uh, someone's machine. Okay, so without further ado, has anybody heard of this, the CIA triad? Who's heard of this? Okay, good. who's not heard of this? Okay, okay, good. So, so this will be new to some people. So there's this principle in like information security that there are three aspects that you wanna protect. And that's confidentiality, you know, secrets. You wanna make sure that if you're communicating with your friend through your phone, nobody can wiretap it, nobody can see the information that you're sending. Uh, so that's like the, the big one that everybody thinks about when they think software security. Oh, my, you know, social security number was stolen or somebody stole my credit card number, all like confidentiality, right? And when you go to a website, they try to reassure you strenuously that your credit card traffic is protected over HTTPS. Uh, but there's really more to it than that. There's integrity. So attackers can't modify protected data. And that's important because say I couldn't read what your password was, but I could change your password to be the password I want it to be, then who cares about confidentiality? Uh, and availability, availability is an interesting one. So this is uh, particularly important say in military applications. If you can't contact the rest of your team, well, that's an attack, right? Divide and conquer, you can, you can, destroy, you can destroy organizations like that. Uh, and also the classic denial of service attack, which has everyone heard of denial of service attacks, DOS attacks? Who's not heard of these? These are all in the news. Uh, you can just, just basically attackers flood a server with, with uh, connection attempts, and then nobody can, nobody can visit that server anymore. So that's an availability, availability problem. Okay. So one big question, and you'll see this all the time in the news, or maybe snake oil salesmen trying to tell you security solutions. Really good question is, given my piece of software, so given that compiler you wrote, is it secure? Well, it's pretty hard to define security without some 
uh, definition about what you mean by security. So it depends. Uh, so for instance, if you put a lock on your door in your house, is it secure if you have that lock? Well, depends on your attacker, right? For some attackers, some opportunistic thieves who may just try to turn the handle and go in, maybe that'll stop them. But for someone who's determined, who has a sledgehammer, it's gonna destroy your lock easily, right? You can just take a hammer, maybe be able to kick the door. Not gonna work, right? So it's really important to define what your assets are, which defines how much it's gonna cost you if your um, security is violated, and what are the goals for the attacker. So this is where you kind of get into threat modeling, and this is its whole area in, in software security world. So I'm no you know, big expert on security, but I kind of enjoy this, enjoy this stuff. Uh, for threat models, you want to ask, you know, what is your attacker's capability? What is going to be the impact or cost to you? So for instance, using a credit card could be dangerous because somebody could skim your credit card instead of number. But if you're carrying around a bunch of cash all the time, well, you have to worry about physical security of that attack. So you got to kind of think about what these trade-offs are and the cost to you if if, uh, if that um, information is lost. You know, what's the impact of it? What is out of scope? So maybe you're not protecting against um, you know, somebody with a sledgehammer. You know, you'd have to have probably reinforced concrete at your house if you want to protect against everything. Okay. So you can take a whole course on this. I, I won't go into too much detail about like how you actually do this, but there's some really good uh, materials you can look at. So OWASP is an organization that has a lot of good detail, a lot of good information on and, and data on attackers. I would also recommend um, this book, which I should have been prepared to, but I would totally recommend this book here. And really anything by this guy, Gary McGraw, can walk you through the whole whole, uh, you know, attack, uh, threat modeling and um, uh, the kind of uh, risk framework that he introduces to decide where to put your security efforts. So, you know, if you, for instance, if you think, oh, well, the, the attacker is going to smash down my door, so let me get a reinforced steel door. Uh, but yeah, what about the frame next to the door? If the frame is weak, then it doesn't matter if your door is steel because they can just break the frame or break the drywall next to your door. So... Okay, not that yet. <laughs> so just some examples. So this is like building on the same examples. So say you have some valuables and you want to protect them by locking them in a safe. Well, if you trust everybody, then you don't even need to lock your safe. Uh, if you think an attacker is not going to use any kind of heavy force, well, they might pick your lock. So buy a better lock. Don't use some old tumbler lock, tumbler lock with two pins. Use some fancy lock. But if you have some attacker with torch or some kind of uh, sledgehammer, then the lock may be the least of your worries. Uh, and interestingly, you also have to worry about these kinds of attacks, which may be in the realm of like social engineering attacks. Maybe if you have the best security in the world, but your sysadmin, it, I don't know, is able to be tricked into giving out his password. You know, maybe some date convinces him to, to, uh, to give out his password then all the security in the world is not going to protect against that. That's the classic insider threat. So security is expensive. This is why you got to make this uh, threat model and assess your risks so that you know what to spend your money on. You can buy the most expensive safe in the world, but if the lock sucks and your security protocol sucks, if you never lock it or you always take it in and out, then it's not going to matter how expensive your safe is. You have to know what your, what your risks are. So some of the, the um, fundamental security mechanisms, uh, and I'll just, again, kind of go through these really quickly. There's some useful techniques you can use. Isolation, principle of least privilege, you know, need to know, fault compartments, and trust and correctness. So isolation uh, is, is uh, pretty much like it sounds. On your, um, on your laptops, for instance, if you have some shared information. If you're sharing your laptop with your roommate or you're sharing a desktop with your roommate, you might have two different user accounts so that your files are isolated from their files. And even if they have access to the computer, they can't read any of your files. So this is one way to ensure, you know, that's sort of uh, one way to ensure it, the hardware and software operating system will actually enforce this for you. 
The principle is least privilege, you know, need to know basis, right? So any piece of software in your machine that's processing your confidential information, you only allow it certain, only allow it the, the most information it needs to run. So most of your applications don't need physical access to your RAM because in your RAM, that's where you're, you have encryption keys in there. You have all your personal information. So none of your processes need physical access to your RAM. Fault compartments. So abstractly speaking, the idea is to isolate um, each component of your software as much as possible so that if something does get, get broken into, so for instance, um, uh, there are a lot of cases of say the NSA's website has been hacked, you know, maybe not these days, but decades ago, the NSA's website has been hacked, but the, but the website is not actually connected to the NSA's internal network. So even though they were able to defeat, someone was able to defeat some part of their system, uh, that break-in is isolated to their, to their machine. So, and of course, trust and correctness. Uh, in the software world, there's a lot of research on formally verifying the correctness of software. So, for instance, your, your compiler. Compiler is really hard to get right, but imagine you had a tool that would automatically check, yes, this is compiling the way it's supposed to. And there, there are actually efforts in the compilation world. There's a tool called CompCert, which is a formally verified, formally verified compiler using mathematical proofs. Okay, so some of the uh, abstractions that the hardware and operating system give you. Let's, let's go over those. So the operating system, who here ta has taken operating systems? Or is this, this is like later, right, I guess. Uh, okay. So as I mentioned before, if you're running multiple programs on your machine, they, in principle, don't have any access to, to uh, read each other's memory, unless there's some sort of Unless of some sort of exploit in your machine. Uh, and so the operating system provides this abstraction on top of your hardware, and nothing can access the hardware physically without going through the operating system. And it ensures that no, no, uh, no processes are, say, accessing the same memory at the same time when they're not supposed to. Uh, and there's all sorts of you know, systems for this. There's, there's uh, you know, your access control lists, your read and write permissions, all those are operating system level abstractions that allow you to provide some kind of protection uh, between processes running on your machine. So for instance, your browser, if you have a JavaScript program running, it's not gonna be able to access your file system unless you, you, know, unless you allow it. Now the hardware provides some abstractions for enforcing these protections. So without any hardware protection, uh, and in the old days of the PC world, like early DOS, every process could read every other process's memory and could write to arbitrary hardware. That would be really, really bad today. Imagine you go to a website and that JavaScript program could just read your, I don't know, read your photo album, for instance. Probably wouldn't want that. Uh, and so the hardware actually enforces this through some techniques, virtual memory um, and rings of trust. So take operating systems, you'll learn all about these, all about these techniques. Okay, so we have this CIA triad, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, and we have the ways of providing access control. And um, this is sometimes called, I think, the golden triad or something, because they're all AU, 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 or something like that. Uh, and so the, the, th the three things here are authentication, you know, who you are, and this can be uh, checked by either something you know, like a password, something you have, like a smart card, or something you are, like biometrics. Biometrics may or may not be considered a secret. It's kind of uh, not necessarily a secret, but something that you can still use for authentication. Authorization, so once you authenticate a user, you can identify who they are. What do they actually have access to do? So you're on your roommates uh, and your computer, you're, you may allow your roommate to have access, but you don't want them to access the files on your account. Uh, and then audit. So even in the case of some unauthorized access, uh, as long as you have an auditing system that ideally can't be tampered with, uh, you can at least track down what happened. You can see who did it and um, yeah, do what you need to do. Okay, so that's just a really, really, really basic, very fast overview of software security. I think it's a really fun field. I encourage you all to like, just read it on your own. You know, read, read, uh, read the latest news. Actually, a couple of, um, now that I think about it, a couple of, uh, sites I can give you just to look for news is Bruce Schneier's cryptogram. 
and you'll see lots and lots of fun stuff here. Like adding a hardware backdoor to a network computer. That could be really bad. Huge amounts of ransomware all the time. There's lots that's in the news all the time. You guys heard about ransomware? Yeah, that's in the news. That's a big thing these days. Another one I would recommend is uh, Sans News Bites. If you ever heard of these, this is like the latest latest news on security breaches and exploits. I'd highly recommend all of these. And there's lots and lots of other resources. Let's see what else is in news here. Ah, voting machines. Yeah. Yeah, who wants those online? Anybody who wants those online? <laughs> no? Okay. More ransomware. So anyway, I think it's just it's a fun area to be in, even if it's like not in not in school. Okay, questions on that? I know that was like super, super fast, but any uh, any questions? What kind of questions do you have? Or you may not even have enough to even ask a question. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, do you recommend any classes that we offer here? Is that what you're saying? Uh, I think that there is a like a principles of security or, so, or something. There, there is a class. So there, the, I'm not sure the name, but there is there is some like uh, security class where they go over like cryptography and and yeah, stuff like this. Oh, there's a cryptography class. Yeah. Maybe that's what I'm thinking. Uh, but I think there is also there is uh, soon there's going to be a, a master's in cybersecurity. Which will have like foundation security, hardware security with secure execution environments. Um, I think it's starting, if not next fall, the fall after that, maybe 2021. 2020, 2021. Masters in cybersecurity. Let me see if this is up yet. But yeah, that's that's in the works. That's like definitely coming out. It may not be publicized yet. Hopefully I was okay saying that. No, I think it's it's probably I think it's public information. Okay, but yeah, I would recommend security is a really fun topic. It's also very lucrative these days. I mean, it's a huge amount of jobs. The the government is at a it's just has a huge shortage for government and industry has a huge shortage of uh, of cybersecurity experts. But today, I want to go over uh, one of the most classic exploits: the stack smashing attack. And to understand what that is, I've also borrowed these slides um, talking about memory corruption attacks. So even if you may not have realized that every time you've gotten a seg fault, you have actually done one of these attacks in some sense. You've caused your own, own software to, to crash by giving it some input that it wasn't expecting. Now, because you're trying to get the input to work, you, know, you don't consider it an attack, but you know, in some sense, that's an attack on your own, on your own, uh, on your own software. Um, but from the security perspective, the, the, the goal is not necessarily to crash your program, although because availability is one of our you know, security principles, uh, that might be the goal to actually take down your machine. I think there was a, a very fun attack where you could send some, send some specially coded message to maybe iMessage or something like that, and it would like crash the phone. So that's, a, that, you know, that's a, basically a memory corruption attack with some fun availability consequences. So the security, um, the, the security aspect of this is that the attacker, at least for these memory corruption attacks that I'm going to show you today, is that the attacker wants to take over the target machine. They want to get access to use this machine as if they are the administrator. So why would you want to do this? Why would you want to like, I mean, you have a computer, right? Why would you want to go take over somebody else's computer? Money. Okay, money. <laughs> any, other, any other reasons why you'd want to like have root access on somebody's network attached machine? Political. political reasons? Why political reasons? Oh, like to tear down the uh, website? Espionage? Well, why would it be good for espionage? Because there's information on the machine? OK. Any other reasons? Turn it into a bot. You could turn it into a bot to do your bidding. Yeah. You could, yeah? Use yeah. it for denial of service. Yeah, do it for denial of service? Yeah, I think you guys can't hear each other. But. Okay. Uh, you could also <laughs> use it to hide your identity. So if you don't, well, yeah, if, if I can use your laptop to go to Google whatever I want to Google, everyone's going to think it's you, right? Oh, <laughs> your Google <Troy>. history. <laughs> You're yeah, so of course, you know, this is, this is the, you know, the kind of um, threat modeling, you know, why would somebody want to do this? Is there something valuable to them? These are all the kind of things you got to think about. Um, and these memory corruption attacks have, have made up 
a huge portion, I can't remember the percentage, but a huge portion of the security vulnerabilities that are still going on today. I think, uh, oh yeah, another resource that you can look at is the CVE database, the Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures database. And this just gives all details on the, the actual attacks, the actual attack model, you know, the way the attack is performed. But I think, uh, let's see. I think these buffer overflow attacks form a huge percentage of these, but I can't find the numbers. But yeah, so these memory these memory attacks, basically, you know, misusing your pointers and misusing your memory buffers, actually allows an attacker to take over control of your machine. Pretty amazing, right? How can you do that? Okay, so we're going to look at we're really just going to look at one today, a buffer overflow attack. But there are a number of these. Oh, here's the data. Okay, the data is here. This is a little old, but you can see even what 14 years ago, this is about 20% of all vulnerabilities. Um, that's pretty amazing. I think it may even be worse today. So it's extremely common in C and C++ programs. So one of the main problems of C and C++ is this lack of memory safety. So there are actually modern languages today, like Rust and Go and Swift and Java, of course that um, all but eliminate these kinds of, of uh, memory corruption attacks, unless you really, really want to make them possible in the language. So one of the first ones was uh, this internet worm in the finger daemon. Has anybody ever heard of the finger command in, in Unix? Yeah, who's heard of this? I've heard of this attack before. Oh, you heard of the attack, but finger was like, it was, I think it was just some, uh, uh, protocol where you could go ask a machine, well, give me information about this user on the machine, and it had a buffer overflow exploit. Okay, so what's really interesting about this from a compiler's perspective is that all of the stuff we learned about in this class, like how the stack works, how function calls work, it all plays into how these memory corruption attacks work. Um, so they are... Uh, system and machine specific. So the um, attacker needs to know what processor the, the uh, um, target is running because we're gonna be injecting assembly code to do our attack. They need to know the OS because the OS has different application binary interfaces. They, have, they implement the function calls differently. Uh, and I'm gonna show you with the Vagrant virtual machine how you can actually, actually do this attack today. So of course there are these you know, differences between between architectures like Little Indian versus Big Indian, which I think you guys learned about in architecture to some degree. And this is you know, the ABI, the stack frame structure. So just a little review about how memory is laid out in the proce processor. Hopefully this is review. Okay, who can tell me what the stack is for? You're implementing it now, right? What's the stack for, yeah. The variables in the main are stored at one place in your stack, and the function calls are stored at one place in your stack, and that's how your your compiler keeps track of what works to do first. Yeah, more or less, more or less. So the, there's there's a for each function call, you have a stack frame, and every time you make a nested call, you add a new stack frame to your stack. So in order you can keep track of the state of the previous call. So that's the stack. You may have some libraries somewhere in memory, shared libraries. You have your heap, which is where, so what, what's the heap for? How do you access the heap? Or how do you manage the heap when you're using C? Malloc, yeah, good, yeah, malloc. Malloc is for, for heap allocated storage. So technically speaking, you can access any of this memory at any time when you're programming in C. You can just give a raw address, but malloc allows you to safely, safely allocate the heap. And then of course you have your your program binary here. So just a little review of the stack frame. So at the, well, this would be the bottom of the stack frame, I guess, in some sense. You have the arguments to your function. You have your return address. So who can tell me what the return address was for, if you remember? Yeah, the, yeah, the, the previously called function where you came from when you call that function. So this is gonna be crucial when we talk about this particular attack today. 
because your program will automatically just jump back to this address, if you remember. So there was this big question when we implemented functions, how do you know how to get back to the place where you were in the code? And that position in code was stored in memory. So this is not just data anymore. This is control. This, these are con this is a, effectively a control structure. It's a branch in memory. Uh, and then, you know, the stack frame pointer was the previous function, uh, function call stack frame and so on. Okay. So the way a buffer overflow works is suppose you've got some web server that has this function and it takes in some pointer to a string and it allocates a local buffer. So where is this buffer going to go? Is this buffer in the heap or is it in the stack? Who says it's in the heap? Stack? Okay, good, stack. It's a local variable, it's in the stack. It's not a pointer, it's a statically allocated array. So that's going to be here on your stack. Now, as you're probably struggling with when you're writing, you know, dealing with these strings, when you use string copy, you can easily overwrite past your buffer. So if some nefarious person, or you've made a, added a bug in your, in your code and you're using uh, proper input, gives you a string that is more than 128 bytes or more than 127 bytes, then when you do the string copy, what's going to happen? Overflow. Overflow. What does that mean? What's going what's to happen to the stack here? So what does string copy do? Uh, it copies all the characters from one string to another string. Yeah, it copies all the characters from this to our buffer string. So if there are more characters, and how does it know what the end of the string is? I'll tell you how good you guys had a good C, uh, intro to C and CS1. <laughs> so you can see all the kind of like fundamentals of, of just how your machine works, how C works, play into these uh, security attacks. Okay, so exactly like you said, when we do the string copy, if string is the string is 136 characters, we're going to copy it into the buffer. But who's to say we can't just keep copying in memory? String copy doesn't care about the stack. You're just telling you're just telling string copy, here's an address, copy all the bytes to that address. String copy doesn't care how many bytes, how many, how many bytes it is. Now that said, you should, it's good practice to use string n copy and give the give the length. That's like, you know, good practice. There's new um, string operations that all where you, you have to you know explicitly specify the length that you want to copy. Okay, so that's the that's the that's the so that's the problem, or that's the the way C the C language works and the way this function call ABI works. Uh, and then the question is, how do we exploit that to take control of somebody's machine? Well, remember this return address. This return. Oh, this is red, and my pointer is red, so you can't see it. Okay, this return address is also on the stack. So if we overwrite that return address with something, what's going to happen when we return from this function? Going to go somewhere else. We're not going to go exactly. We're not going to go to the place that we were supposed to go. We're not going to go to the place, the address that our caller pushed onto the stack. We're going to go to some other place. If this is zero, what's going to happen if this is, if we, if we accidentally overwrite with zero, or the, word, the whole word is zero, what are we going to get? What's going to happen when we try to branch to zero? Probably a seg fault. Yeah. That's what a seg fault is, right? You're trying to, well, probably going to be a seg fault because you can't read the memory at that location. Okay. So if we can somehow exercise some control over where this return address is going to jump to, then we can, and, and we can actually control the data that it's jumping to, then we can run arbitrary code at the same privilege level of our, uh, our program. Uh, so one of the main tricks here is to use this no-op slide. So no-op is an instruction that, well, at least Intel has, I think most processors have it, that means no operation. It's, a, it's an op code that doesn't change the state of your machine. And so, um, so the, what attackers have used this for 
is because it may be difficult to get this return address exactly correct, they'll use this NOP, NOP slide. So it's a, a bunch of NOP commands so that you increase the chance that your return address will hit that NOP slot, slide. And then when the flow of control keeps executing, because recall that the stack is growing down, but the memory addresses are going up and your program counter is increasing. Uh, so it'll hit somewhere in this, this uh, the return address will, will return you somewhere into this NOP slide and then start running your program. Well, how did you get a program into memory in the first place? How do we do that? So recall that what how this uh, what this buffer over what the buffer overflow came from is some say this was an attacker controlled input. The attacker's values are being overwritten on the stack or overwriting the stack. So if the attacker is ultra clever, they can not only overwrite the stack with some arbitrary data, they can compile down a program because. What is, pro, what, is a, what is code? Code is just data in memory. The memory holds both code and data. Code is just a bunch of uh, numbers in binary. So if you can compile a program, encode it as, your, as some string, you can actually fill the memory with your program of your choosing. And if you can overwrite the return address, and have it jump to this code of your choosing, then you can execute whatever you want. Questions on this so far? I know it's sort of a lot of like moving pieces. Questions so far? What are your questions? Yeah. So I'll make that too. Like, like, so I understand that he's going to give an input and try to offer overflow, but how is he going to actually like try to get? Uh, that's a good question. That's a good question. Um, so it depends on the specifics of the program itself. So for instance, exfiltrating data, like how, are you, how can you cause it to reveal data to you? Uh, if that data resides somewhere else in memory and you know how the program works, then you can write code that will access that memory and print it or exfiltrate it somehow. If this is a web application, you have to get it written out to the web page. For taking control of the machine, remember that this program is running with the privileges not of the attacker, but the privileges of whoever ran this program. So if it's root, like you know the ls command or all these other core utilities that have to access uh, privileged content, that attacker will then run as root. If it's a web server, the attacker will then run as the web, the web server, because you've injected code into the privileged process. So it's very, very context dependent. It's very dependent on the actual program itself. So you can have these kind of, you know, the, the fundamentals of this are actually fairly simple. You know, if you, if you know how the machine works, you know how the compiler works. Like once you know that, the principle is pretty, pretty straightforward. The really hard part is getting an actual piece of code that has this vulnerability. Because you can certainly write something that's vulnerable, which I'll, which I'll show you. But finding this in code, and that's actually worth tons of money today. You can actually make money just finding these vulnerabilities in, uh, in code. Yeah? Uh, there's a no-op command. What's it used for? Oh, that's, uh, that's so that um, I think because getting this return address right is not easy, not always easy. So in our, in our case, we're going to, we're going to have a much simplified version, but, and so I don't actually, I don't actually design these exploits. I just understand them enough to, to show them to you. But I think the case is that you may not know the exact uh, location of the return address. Uh, so you add these no, this no op slide to add a little slop in your guess about what the return address is going to be because the no ops are guaranteed to continue, continue running until you reach, you know, your actual payload. Okay, so some details, if we're using a st string copy, 
then your program can't contain an null terminator because it'll stop copying. Uh, and you also want to make sure you don't actually like crash the program. You know, this is like a virus. You know, the virus doesn't want to kill its host if it, if it, if it wants to spread. So the overflow shouldn't, you know, kill your program. Uh, and there's, you know, there's all these famous, there's a whole, there's a ton of these stack smashing and buffer overflow attacks. Uh, and as, as we sort of hinted at, there's a bunch of, bunch of uh, library functions that are standard in all C installations that are really the culprits here that can expose these buffer overflow vulnerabilities to the world. Okay, so let's, let's jump into actually doing one of these vulnerabilities. So I have used a guide from, I used, uh, let's see, let's see if I can find this guide. So if you go to the lecture slides for today, feel free to do this on your own. I think it's a, it's, it's a pretty fun exercise. It'll teach you a lot about, you know, how your machine works, how a compiler works. Uh, I just use this, you know, stack smashing tutorial here, and it goes into much more detail than I'm gonna go today. And the attack I'm showing you today won't really work uh, anymore on modern machines for reasons that I'll, that I'll show you later. Because as these exploits have become more prevalent, there's been defenses and then ways to get around the defenses, new attacks, new defenses. And so this tutorial will actually walk you through even more than I'm going to show you today. Okay, so let's take a look at this attack. Okay, let me get my notes. Okay, so I've written, or I took a program, uh, and it has this, this uh, vulnerability just like, basically just like we saw on the slides. So the main function, um, just print something out, calls the vulnerable function. The vulnerable function has some buffer here of size 80, and it reads in 400 characters for some stupid reason, <laughs> and then tries to uh, print that and taunts us with saying we can't access the shell. So what we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to run the command line shell as root. So in this scenario, this program, it has root privileges. So for instance, if you look at say, uh, if you look at the core utilities of your, of your machine, you'll see that the LS program um, is owned by root and can do things that root can do that you can't do. So if you could somehow control what this program does, like say you could replace it, then you would be able to run as root. So in our scenario, this, this uh, program is also owned by root, so I've made it owned by root. So if we can, um, yeah, if we can inject our code into this running program, then we'll be able to run as root. So that, that's what we're attempting to do. So we're going to try to figure out how to carefully overwrite the, uh, the um, return address in this function call so that once we return from this function, instead of returning here, we return to our own code. All right. So let's walk through some of the details of this. So it's already built. So I'm going to first create, just create an input of just all A's. Does anybody remember what A is in ASCII? Oh, that sounds like a good guess. <laughs> you don't actually have to know this. I mean, whatever 41 is, 4196, 41, this is hex, so hex 41, whichever. Four times 16 or whatever, 80 something. Uh, okay, so that's what A looks like in hex. So I'm going to first run, well, what am I first gonna do? Okay, so I'm gonna use GDB to do this. And if you look at that guide, I've, there's notes online for this. So you can, you can like um, try, to, try to do this yourself at home. Uh, so I've, there's this uh, framework in Python for GDB that allow you to do this like exploit design. So I'm going to run 
use GDB to run this program, and I'm just going to run it with some normal input, like just three A's. And if I run the program, so R just means run my run that program that I just showed you. Then, oh, this is a lot of information here. Uh, this does not quite fit. Uh, All right, I'm going to have to scroll around. Okay, so this. This GDB extension is very nice to use. It shows you all the values of the registers. It shows you the code at the point where you had a breakpoint, and it shows you the stack. So you can see here at the top of our stack is some address to our string, our input string. So that should look familiar, right? That's our, our input string, there are three A's. Now, if we take this input, this is a 400 character input that's trying to fill an 80 character array or whatever it was, 40 character array. So what's gonna happen when we do this? What's gonna happen when I try to input this giant array? Seg fault, yeah, something's gonna happen. So, in, uh, oh, I have a break point. I have a break point here, so it's not gonna, not gonna crash yet. But notice here, my stack. My stack is now filled not with a pointer to a string, but with a whole bunch of A's. So I have just blown away, I have blown away. So that's, you know, that's the buffer overflow there. And yeah, I can, you know, I can keep stepping through it. Uh, and indeed, I get a seg fault eventually because it's trying to, this one of these is the return address and I've blown it away. Okay, so that's how we can like break this thing, but how can we use this to exploit it to our advantage? Uh, oh yeah, and just to show, I can just show you what the stack pointer would look like. So you can see our stack pointer is just filled with A's. And is there anything interesting in our registers? Let's see. So, yeah, this is our this is our stack pointer. Okay. Okay, so using this handy dandy extension to GDB that's specifically designed for creating exploits, I'm going to create a specially formed input. Now this looks like a bunch of garbage. But this is apparently using this uh, very clever technique called a De Bruyne sequence. It basically allows you to have a unique string at every point in the sequence. And so what this is going to be used for is to figure out where in the stack our stack pointer lives. Because if each one of these points in the stack is filled with a different piece of information, uh, we can just print out the stack pointer and say, okay, it's you know that piece of our input and we know the offset of our stack pointer from the buffer. And this, this framework allows us to do this very easily. So uh, where is it? So let me print out our stack pointer again. Okay, so it's been corrupted with this sequence, and we can use this instruction pattern offset. Where is it? To tell us exactly how far away our buffer is from our, ooh, whoops, that doesn't seem right. Sorry, one second. Oh, I'm using the debugging version. Let me use the non-debugging version. Okay, so I create this De Bruyne sequence. I read it in. I take a look at my stack pointer, and I use this pattern to tell me 
the offset of my stack pointer from the beginning of the buffer. So it tells me it's 104. Okay, so now I'm going to construct an input that will help me find the instruction that will help that will allow me to overwrite the instruction pointer. So I've already filled this in. So what, what's going to happen here is it's going to fill up the uh, buffer with a bunch of A's, 104 A's, to give me the offset to my instruction pointer. And then I'm going to overwrite my instruction pointer with this specific byte sequence. Okay. So just to kind of back up and review, I know I kind of stumbled there a little bit. So we're blowing away our stack frame, but we want to do it in a targeted way. So we use these handy dandy features of this framework to help us find exactly where the instruction pointer is relative to our buffer. Because if we know that information, then we can just overwrite that instruction pointer, uh, or at least the, you know, the, the return address with arbitrary data. So this little Python program will create a file that has you know, a whole bunch of A's, 104 A's, followed by our specially selected sequence. And then followed by you know, filler C's for the rest of the buffer. So if I now run our program again with this new input, what should we expect to see in our instruction pointer? Yeah, that special sequence. So you can see here, it returned, you know, 42, 42, 42, 42, exactly what we targeted in, with, our, with our input. So just to kind of show you, here's the registers. So here is my instruction pointer register. Oops. Oh, sorry, jumping around a bit. But you can see here's our instruction pointer register. So okay, just a quick review of what happened. Let's take a look at our code again. We input that specially constructed array. It had 104 A's in the beginning, had 42, 42, 42, 42. And we input that here when we read. And that overwrote this, the first 80 characters of this buffer. Then it overwrote the rest of the stack. And then it overwrote the, the return address with that 42, 42, 42 sequence. So now we've targeted a little uh, word to our instruction to our instruction pointer. So that gives us control over jumping somewhere. So the next thing we need to do, all right, so any, any questions on that? Questions so far? Questions so far? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yes, yeah, I think that's, oh, oh no, the offset of the, um, no, the offset of the instruction pointer needs to be, uh, yeah, so I don't design these exploits, but you need to, um, you need to uh, target what the, what the instruction pointer is going to be. So it can't just be a no-op, because a no-op may not correspond to a branch in, to memory where you, where you, that you want to go to. Um, so I think you do have to target the instruction pointer, but um, the program, you know, without uh, extra defenses, the program does not change. So that layout of the stack is not going to change, right? Because it has to be, be able to be called from other, other functions. So that stack layout is fixed for the function. Um, yeah, I think, I think that's the case. Does that, does that make sense? So the, yeah, the, the instruction pointer can't just be blown away arbitrarily. Okay, so now let's actually exploit this. And the way we're going to exploit this is with this shell code that I got from the internet. So there's this website that conveniently has a bunch of pre-compiled binary code. Is this the right one? Oh, this looks like not the right one. Here we go. This is the shell code I'm using. So all it does is call the set UID bit, which means change my user to root, only allowed um, under for certain processes, and then run shell. 
just for fun. And then it does it just for fun. So if I can successfully get a program to do this for me, then I will have admin access. I'll be able to do whatever the root administrator can do. And so this is the um, assembly version of this. The system calls, this jumps into the operating system. This is your set UID system call. I think I even, let's see, I, I even gave you a, uh, I gave you a list of the system calls. So you learn more about this when you take operating systems. So there's a convention in Linux that each system call has a particular number. So if we're doing system call 69, then that is the set UID system call. So this is the, the system call interface is how you have the protection from the process space and the kernel space. So the kernel space can access all the hardware, process space can't. If you want to call into the operating system, uh, there's special machinery at the processor level that allows you to switch to the to the uh, to the kernel okay so this is that's that's where I got this shell code from I just took this string here so this is it encoded as a string okay so there's my shell code and the way this is going to be delivered to my program is I'm not going to use that no op slide Instead, I'm going to use an environment variable, which is a which is a Unix thing. So, um, yeah. So this 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 is kind of a Unix thing. You learn about this in operating systems, but this is like a variable that's uh, always available to any program that's being run on your on your machine. So this has important things like the path, like where you find applications to run. Uh, but you can put whatever values you want in here, and then every running program has access to these. So if we can store our shell code in there, then we can convince it to jump to that to that shell code if we know the address of it. So the next thing we're, that we need to do is we need to figure out what the address of this of this shell code is. So because this because this uh, environment variable is available to every running program, uh, it's going to be in memory somewhere, and there this little program here will figure out what that what that address is. So get event, get environment variable is how you, you know, how you actually get that string. And so it just does a little computation to figure out what the uh, address and memory of that is. Now this particular attack will not work these days for, for a specific reason that I'll, that I'll show you in a little bit. Um, but assuming we're in the old days and we have a fixed address for this shell code, this is the exact address we need to jump to if we want to start running our shell code. So, okay, so to put this all together, we've overflowed our buffer, we've controlled exactly where the return address is, and we've uh, inserted shell code into, into memory of the running process using this Unix environment, and we have the address we want to jump to. So this is all of the pieces that we need in order to exploit this piece of code. Okay, so do you want to see the exploit? Should we try it? Okay, so first let's try the program uh, just by itself, as I think you've seen. So if I type in, you know, I can overflow the buffer. This is, let's see if I can get to more than eight characters. So this is when I run it normally. No shell for me, segmentation full. Uh, so where is my, oh yeah. So let me just, See if this address is the same. So this is the address I want to insert at the return address. And so I'm going to generate another program or another input that will have, you know, 104 A's, my offset to my return address, and then the address of my shell code. So when I run this input, uh, it should then branch to my to my shell code. So let's see if it does. And I tried this before, so it should. So this is a little shell hackery this just says send the input to my program and then just send whatever i want to write to my program if i just type cat it just reads from standard in and let's see if this works it says no shell for you uh oh that didn't work uh oh i broke something 
Did I? Oh, I didn't actually run Python exploit, did I? I think I did not run this. I hope. Okay, there we go. So now, as you can see, I'm just running in a shell right now. And if I use the who am I command, I'm root. So I can even write things to the root and it'll let me do it. So exit out of there, and now I've got this new file at root that is owned by root. I can't delete it because I am a non-privileged user. And voila, there's the exploit. Okay. A one Was that one clap? Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 it's okay. It's okay. I was kidding, I was kidding, I was kidding. Okay, so, all right, questions on this? Questions on this, yeah. So since now you have an ID yourself, how does the system going to know if it's including actual root and the one that you have? Uh, what do you mean? Now you hack, now, you, now, you're, now you're pretending that you're root, but yeah. you're also, that's your, that's your system as well. So how's your computer, like what I'm saying is how are you going to go back? Well, it doesn't, there's no difference. There's no difference between, so the, the attacker is no different from the system administrator. That's the whole problem, is that there's no distinction between their privileges and the root privileges. It's as if you like stole somebody's ID card and now you can access, you know, now they can spend your money, they can go to the cafeteria and get delicious food. Yeah. So we wrote shell code to the environment variable, and then we like yeah. went to query that variable. So exactly. Like yeah. Get the shell code in the environment. Oh yeah. So I oh sorry I didn't didn't quite show that. So um, so the environment so the environment variable can be set like this with this export command. Uh, yeah. So I mean you you can kind of think what the what the like threat model of this is. So this is not necessarily, re well, this could be a remote attack. This is not necessarily an attack like on a web server page. This would have to be your local user on some shared machine that you don't have access to. And there's a program on that machine, like Classic, that uh, is owned by root and has this set UID. That this just means it's allowed to run as root. So this set UID command has always been kind of a thorn in the side of Unix security. Uh, but as long as you have a program like this, and it has that buffer overflow vulnerability, um, you can exploit it. Now, one of the countermeasures against this is something called uh, address space uh, randomization. So I actually had to turn this off in order to get this attack to work. If I turn it back on, and I try to get the address of that, uh, that environment variable, You'll notice that every time I get the address of it, it's in a different place in memory. So what address space randomization does is, is at runtime is it dynamically changes where in memory, basically changes the layout of your memory randomly at runtime. So we exploited the fact that we knew, you know, that the um, at compile time and at runtime, the memory layout is fixed every time you run the program. You know, these are deterministic machines. They're going to do the same thing every time. But we can add in this randomization in the OS level to prevent, the, the, at least prevent this kind of attack. Yeah. If you wanted to, if you had address space land randomization or just in general, uh, it, it depends, it depends on how you're trying to attack. So in this, in this kind of a, you know, attack model, I'd be logged into the machine as some unprivileged user. But yeah, that's how you get the shell code in. Now I think more, yeah, more traditionally, I think the shell code is given in the, uh, or the, um, you know, the uh, instruction, the return address is modified so that it will jump to that NOP slide and attack the shell code. Uh, yeah, I think that's like traditionally how it's, how it's done. Uh, so, okay. So this is how we can do it, running it from the command line, but how does something like Apache, for instance, how does that allow us to, uh, to how can we send inputs to Apache? Or like a web server, I'm sorry. If we have a web server, how do we send inputs to the web server? So who's taking like networking? Learned about like TCP IP. Is anybody taking networking? No, a little bit? I know a little bit, not too much. So since we have a little time, I can show you something else here. 
So even though a web server may seem like some fancy thing, you know, you go to your browser and you get, you know, these, these pretty pictures, all a web server is, is just a program. It's running on, on someone else's machine, just like it's running on your machine. And in the same way, I can pass inputs to a program running on my machine. TCP IP allows you to send inputs to a program running on somebody else's machine. So the same vulnerabilities apply more or less. I mean, not, maybe not the environment variables, although in some cases you can modify those as well from the internet, but you can, do, but whenever you go to somebody else's web page, you really, they're really just allowing you to pass arbitrary inputs to their web page, to their, to their web server, to a process running on their web server. So for instance, I can open up a connection to Google's site and I can ask it, I can just send it some arbitrary string and it will send me back to some of you who have done any web programming, it'll send me back a massive, a massive web page. So all I did was just open up basically remote process execution, more or less, to some server that Google owns and I sent it this string. And because the string is part of the HTTP protocol, Google's web server will say, oh yeah, I know that you want the root web page and I'm going to send it to you. And so it's just like a, basically a chat window with between computers. And now it's sent me back this massive string. So it sent me some you know, metadata about it. And then it just sent me the web page. That's all it is. It's just input and output, just like you do on the command line, except now you can do it on somebody else's machine. And so if that web server is vulnerable, it has one of these buffer overflow vulnerabilities, then you may, you may be able to do something like, this may make Google mad, but you can pass some you know, long string. And so no vulnerability, I didn't crash their machine. They accepted that input and just said, I can't find that page. You know, it says, that's an error, right? That's the page you get, right? Isn't that, the, that's the page you get, right? When you, if you, this is just a URL. So if I just copy this and ask Google for this page, that's the URL. So I can just say, hey, Google, give me this URL. And that's the exact page that I got, right? It's just the browser is interpreting that text and drawing you pretty pictures, but really, all it is is just opening a process on a remote machine and sending an input, getting its output. That's all it is. And so if, if a, your web server has one of these vulnerabilities, so like Apache web server vulnerability uh, shellcode string. So actually I have a web server and I will see these attacks in my logs. I'll see like a long string of A's. So will be like, hey, and you know that's just like a piece of shellcode somewhere. Oh, not many returns returns shellcode. That's funny. Uh-oh. Uh it looks like I'm a bot. Not a bot. Well, anyway. Uh, trying to find one of these strings. I, I get these on my web server all the time. They're just trying to exploit. Uh, they're trying to find these buffer overflows in an Apache server. But I can't find them. Let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, well, anyway, you see the idea. So it's the same kind of idea. It just happens to be on a process running on somebody else's machine. Uh, so yeah, if it's my own machine, maybe I don't need to exploit my own machine. Um, if I have a remote login with uh, like SSH to use this, for instance, please don't do this, but uh, you can control the environment variables there. Uh, if it's a web server, you can pass inputs as the URL. The URL is just an input. And the Apache web server has, you know, it's been around for a long time. It's had tons and tons of these exploits. Uh, but these kind, of, these kind of buffer overflow attacks are still being found today in the wild uh, and used, yeah, used to take over people's machines. All right, so I think that's, that's pretty much it. It pretty much covers software security. I think that's fun stuff. Uh, I encourage you to you know, check this stuff out. Yeah. What about that video? The video, oh yeah. Good point, good point, sorry. The video, okay. So this is kind of a fun use of a, uh, of a buffer overflow. And basically what it does, so it is a, a, a glitch that if you 
give, so, so what is a video game? A video game is just a special kind of program that takes your inputs, which are your controller button presses, and gives you outputs, which are pictures on a screen, right? Sends signals to a screen. It's the same thing. It's code inside. So if you can get the right inputs that will cause it to have a buffer overflow, then you can also control where it's going to jump to. And this is an exploit where you can branch to the end of the game. So this is all, this is not a cut. This is the actual game. You notice there's some glitching here, right? See this glitching? And it will just branch to the end of game sequence. And it's like the fastest speed run in this in Super Mario world because you can just use this control exploit. And this video is insane. It goes into huge amounts of detail about the Super Nintendo's processor, about how the actual exploit happens, the actual opcodes. So if you have 10 minutes to fry your brain a little bit, you can follow this. And so the crazy thing is you don't you can't just write arbitrary strings. You have to move the characters and move the sprites in and out of the screen in order to fill up these buffers. And so this is your buffer here. This is your buffer. And eventually, you cause... So Yoshi here likes to eat the berries. And so you cause Yoshi to eat the... Uh, the whatever that football guy is called. So these are the berries. And you somehow cause... Yeah, you cause... I don't know. Somehow you cause, yeah, you cause Yoshi to eat the... Uh, you know, that... That so character and it's, that's what triggers the uh, triggers the crash. So anyway, I recommend watching this. It's pretty it's a pretty fun watch. You can learn more about you know the applications, the compilers, and, and architecture and everything. So any last questions? Uh, feel, uh, come up if you have any questions. It's already uh, eight forty five. So enjoy and uh, have a good night.